So good to be back. And we welcome each and every one of you back to the Christ Jesus College and Seminary and the Christ Jesus Chapel. <laughs> There's nothing like to remind you of your humanity than when you're shaving and you nick yourself and you see your blood. And yes, we all are mortal and we've got a clock ticking that way. That's why it's so important to use our time so wisely. You read it all over in the book of Proverbs, how important it is to use our time to gain knowledge, to obtain wisdom, to seek the Lord. And that's what we do here at this channel. We welcome you. This is the best time for you to click and subscribe and join our channel and click that notification bell because we're really getting ready in the will of the Lord and releasing new content. I'm getting a lot of emails and phone calls from people who are in financial distress. Many people argue, are we really in a recession? I say yes. I'm not a specialist in economy, but it's obvious that many people are feeling the pinch this Christmas season. And I'm reminding everyone by email and by phone of the promise of Jesus Christ himself in Matthew 6.33. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and all its righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. God knows, our Father knows all our needs. He says the, gentle, the Gentiles have these needs. He says, your father knows ahead of time that you have these needs. So we do not need to worry or to fret or to be anxious about any of our financial needs. I appreciate everyone reaching out and asking for prayer, but I will also reassure everyone, God is providing for you. And he has bounty. He owns everything in the whole universe. And there's nothing more important than his beloved child, you. Also getting phone calls from people who have had injuries, who are sick, who have been in the emergency room in the hospital. Please know that all of us here at the Christ Jesus College and Seminary and the Christ Jesus Chapel, we are praying for you because we love you. My family and I have been experimenting and we've been enjoying watching the TV series, The Chosen. Very interesting. Christian entertainment. It's been very inspiring to watch it. But I was told by someone, one of our bright scholars in the Christ's College and Seminary, that there is one verse in the Bible that we need to keep in mind in watching anything, whether it's the Passion or the Son of Man or any of these other movies, we're never to add or subtract from the Word of God. So yes, we are enjoying. It's good. It's wholesome. But remember, nothing trumps, nothing beats, nothing will ever come close to the Word of God. And our perception of Christ and our perception of the disciples and and, and our perception of the chosen should always come directly, unfiltered, unadulterated from Scripture. So are we ready for today's lesson? Of course you are. And we welcome all of you. We've got a wonderful crew together here this morning, and we're going to review the word Nazarene. Now, it says that Joseph took his son, to Nazareth to fulfill the prophecy that Jesus would be called the Nazarene. Now, I'm not, I should say we are not, the largest seminary in the world. Maybe we're the David of seminaries. That's kind of funny. Size doesn't matter. You see, if God is with you, then you're in the majority. In most other seminaries that 
we are affiliated with and we talk to, they say Matthew must have been quoting from a prophecy that's not in the Old Testament. We can't find that prophecy. You can try. I challenge you. Again, whatever I say here in this channel, don't take my word for it. I'm just, look, I cut myself here shaving this morning. I'm I'm just like you. I'm human. I'm 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 just riddled with idiosyncrasies. But to be told that Matthew, the apostle Matthew, who wrote the sacred scriptures of, of, of the book of Matthew, Jesus chose him for that reason. And to say that he has no backup prophecy for that, and to hear people who are presidents and chancellors and professors at other seminaries, shame on you. Shame, 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 shame. Remember that there's a scene in the movie Chosen that's very interesting. Mary is trying to teach someone the Torah. And the Torah, and of course, is in Hebrew. Now, unless you have... You see, my father is from Galilee. My mother is from Judea. And so, in fact, my wife is also from Israel. So I guess I have an advantage because if you're going to learn Hebrew or Aramaic or even Arabic, you know, Arabs are Semites as well as the Jews. In that language, there's no vowels, consonants. Remember A E I O U? Well, there are not that many vowels in Hebrew. There are not many vowels in Aramaic. We're going to come back to it for a moment. We're going to compare now the difference between being a Nazarite and a Nazarene and why it's important that Jesus was going to be called a Nazarene and not a Nazarite. Hang on. So a Nazarite is anyone who consecrates themselves to the service of God. They're consecrating themselves. They're saying, take me. Take me, God, and do whatever you want. And there are certain stipulations to this vow. You find this vow, this vow in Numbers chapter 6. Abstaining from alcohol. Not cutting your hair. Yes, it means you're going to look like a Rastafarian. And you avoid defilement by being close to anything that's dead, both human and animal. This is found in Numbers chapter 6. Now the word Nazarite actually means, in Hebrew, consecrated or separated. And God wants you, my friend, to be separated to him. We will all make mistakes. But what God wants is your heart. Now, here are some examples of some Nazarites. Samson. Yes, Samson had hair like a Rastafarian. No mention of him drinking alcohol, but he was defiled by being with a corpse. Can you remember? Anyone? I'll give the chance for anyone on our chat to let me know when was he defiled by being with a dead corpse. Remember he killed the lion? He was on his way and he killed the lion. And so he broke his vow as a Nazarite. So Samson, unfortunately, with his roving eyes, was unable to be a Nazarite. He couldn't pull it off. And he kills a lion thereby breaking his vow in being a Nazarite. The next Nazarite in Scripture is Samuel, and Samuel pulls it off, but his sons couldn't. And Samuel was rejected by Israel and said, we will not have Samuel. And God had to have a chat with Samuel and said, please don't take it personally. <laughs> They're actually rejecting me. Remember that as a servant of God. If you as a servant of God, if you're rejected, don't take it personal. You're just a messenger. I'm just a messenger. They're, re they're rejecting the Lord. John the Baptist was a Nazarite. That's right. 
Yeah. Charlton Heston should have had Rastafarian hair. He pulled it off. But King Herod didn't like him. And a certain woman made sure that he got capital punishment and got decapitated. You know, Paul was a Nazarite. Did you know that? <laughs> Make sure you read the book of Acts very carefully. He takes the vow of the Nazarite twice. He shaved his head twice in the book of Acts. That's right. You know, before I got ordained, I did the same thing. I don't look very good bald, though, I can tell you that much. And he, too, pulled it off. But he, too, was destroyed by the Roman Empire by an edict by Caesar with capital punishment. Now, you compare the word Nazarite with the word Nazarene. There's only one Nazarene. Hallelujah. I give all, all the praise and glory to God. Many Nazarites, but only one Nazarene. That's Jesus. He pulls it off. And Samson kills a physical lion, but... <laughs> Hallelujah. Jesus kills the spiritual lion, the lion that is roaring, always trying to destroy us and deceive us. He kills the roaring lion and does not defile himself. He's never been defiled. And yes, he was destroyed just like Paul. By an edict of Pontius Pilate, physically abused by the Sanhedrin the night before. But Jesus said, destroy this temple. You see, many people are so caught up with this supposed new temple that's coming down the pike. We are the temple. You see, Jesus said, destroy this temple. And in three days, I will raise it up. So the Nazarene is a Nazarite who pulls it off and lives for eternity. So in, in our Christmas series, which I really enjoyed, and I should put together as a book, let's review this prophecy. Matthew 2, 23 says that Jesus went, that says that he went and lived in a town called Nazareth, so it was fulfilled through the prophets that he could be called a Nazarene. And I'm going to show you where this is found in Scripture. Here we go. Where is this prophecy found in the Old Testament? Well, first you have to understand that the word Nazarene in the Hebrew word is Nestor, which means branch or sprout. Now, if you guys are keen with the fifth gospel, then you know Isaiah 11. It says the branch, the branch, the way it's spelled in Hebrew, it's N-Z-R, the branch, the vine, N-Z-R. Well, how do you spell Nazareth? N-Z-R. See, my friends, it was there all the time. Unfortunately, our Anglo-Saxon friends are unaware of all the consonants that are in Hebrew and Aramaic, the branch and Nazareth are spelled exactly the same, N-Z-R. It says here, Isaiah 11, 1, a shoot, a branch, will come up from the stump of Jesse, that's Jesus, and his roots, a branch, N-Z-R, will bear fruit. There you go. There you have the prophecy. That's where Matthew is getting it all from. Now, let me just hone this in here because I think it's really important. Matthew's point was Jesus was going to be sprouted up or sprouting up in a very obscure village in Galilee. He was predicted by the prophets. And even though Nazareth was not thriving and in existence during the prophets, it's still spelt 
N Z R. Now you have to also understand that people from N Z R Nazareth are despised and rejected. Look what it says here. You know, Nazareth is only 55 miles from Jerusalem, north. Not much water, and had a negative reputation among all the Jews. Galileans were pretty much looked down upon by the Judeans because Galilee was a almost like a highway between two great different civilizations. And Nazareth in particular was 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 really despised. Now, look what Nathaniel says. And you and you, when you watch the movie Chosen, you see this a lot. There's a lot of references to, to Nazareth, both directly and indirectly. Can anything good come from Nazareth? Look, look where Matthew is also taking this from. Not only is he taking it from Isaiah 11, he's taking it from the prophetic Psalm, Psalm 22. I am a worm, not a man, scorned by everyone, despised by the people. All who see me mock me and hurl insults, shaking their heads. Obviously, this has to do with the fact that he's from Nazareth. So Nazarenes are scorned. Can anything good come from Nazareth? Yes, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Look at Isaiah 53. He was despised, rejected by mankind, a man of suffering, familiar with pain, like one from whom people hid their faces. He was despised, and we held him in low esteem. So do you see where Matthew is? Matthew is very, very sharp, very brilliant. He's taking these verses, he's taking this, this prophecy about Jesus being a Nazarene from Psalm 22, Isaiah 53, and specifically Isaiah 11. Everything in the Word of God is perfect. Take it a step further. Jesus himself identifies himself as Jesus of Nazareth. I say, Where would you find that, brother? Well, go to Acts but the book of Acts, when he meets Paul, he says, who are you? I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom thou persecutest. And Saul again repeats that story in Acts chapter 22. One of the names of the Christians in the early church was to be called a Nazarene. Nasara means Nazarene, means someone who is following, who is a follower of Jesus Christ. And my question to you this morning is, are you following the Nazarene? You see, because the difference between being a Nazarene and a Nazarite is a Nazarite, you can take, you can take the vow of a Nazarite for, for a very small segment of time and then disavow yourself. But a Nazarene is someone who follows Jesus in this life and also lives in eternity with the Nazarene because he himself is a Nazarene. I'm a Nazarene. Are you a Nazarene? What does it mean to be a Nazarene? You know, I was talking to a very holy brother last night, someone who's really encountered the Lord and has discernment of the Holy Spirit. We were talking about what it means to be a Christian. That, that many people think that they're Christians, they act like Christians, they look like Christians, but they really don't know the Lord. You see, you have to know what it means when Paul says that I preach Christ crucified. Well, you, well if you come to the foot of the cross and you look at Jesus, you say, wow, what a holy man. What a man of God, the Son of God on the cross. But unless you understand that you are a sinner, then you'll never experience repentance. Salvation is by grace. It's a gift. It's a gift. 
And the only way you can appreciate the Nazarene and become a Nazarene is by the blessed grace of God that when you're at the foot of the cross, you realize that he's not dying there because of himself, but he's dying there because of your sins and my sins, your attitudes and my attitudes, your motives and my motives, your failures, my failures, our failures. And when we look at him, and he looks down at the cross and he says to you, I love you and I forgive you, that's how you become a Nazarene. Hope this was a blessing. And I'm wishing you a great day in Jesus. And as, as always, I love you, but he loves us the most. He's coming soon.